<clears throat> Thanks very much for the invitation and uh, apologies uh, for not being in person. Actually, I had uh, everything sorted out. And uh, in, the, in the last minute, uh, for some personal reasons, I had to cancel the travel um, Bama, because I always love to attend uh, uh, the, the conference. And uh, I just listened to a, you know, a presentation by students. And that's our future. So I'm super excited about uh, what, what these guys are doing. Uh, there is one note about YouTube. I'm not sure what, whether YouTube is still going to exist, right? In a, when they're 50 or 60 years old, there may be some, some other, the way things are going, you know, uh, there may be some other uh, channel. So, so today I want to talk about two things that have been, uh, that I've been working on for a you know, large portion of my professional career for almost two decades. And uh, they, they split into two, uh, two sort of mini-me presentations. Uh, the first one is I'm going to talk about technologies uh, that, uh, that will be required to, to find life on Mars. And then I'm going to talk about technology that uh, will be required to sustain human life on Mars. So let's, let's start with the first one, uh, search for life. A, Search for life, um, if, you, if you're looking for, for life, you have to consider the three ingredients of life. Uh, these are a, a ke chemistry, it's chemicals. Uh, you need to have uh, certain elements that make up say organic matter. If you don't have them, probability that there is life is slim. Uh, you also need um, a heat, um, the thermal energy, uh, whether it's chemical, uh, sun, uh, geothermal, um, any source of energy is fine, um, but that's, that's one of the prerequisites for life. You need, you need energy. And finally, to, to, to find life as we know it, you obviously need water. And it um, doesn't have to be ultra pure water. It could be you know, dirty water, salty water, but you still need water. So Mars um, is uh, one of these planets that have all three ingredients. That's why it's very exciting uh, to go and, and explore. A couple of years ago, uh, the Mars Express, actually an instrument, Marsis on Mars Express, um, found, uh, found lakes um, in uh, large, very, very large lakes in uh, just below South Polar Lake deposits in the South uh, Pole of Mars. Uh, these lakes are approximately one mile deep. And uh, these lakes are not at zero C. Uh, they are somewhere between, you know, the tens of degrees below freezing. And what that means is they are actually hypersaline lakes. Um, so yeah, there are some microbes that can, uh, that, you know, do just fine in a high, very salty waters and um, extremely hot, uh, salty waters. So, uh, you know, potential for finding something in these lakes is, I would say, pretty high. Uh, and uh, if we find, you know, a couple of lakes in the South Pole, uh, I'm sure there's there are many, many other lakes not just in the south, but also in the north. And uh, we actually have been to north too. Uh, Mars Phoenix uh, landed uh, in, 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 over a decade ago in the uh, uh, northern polar regions, uh, regions of Mars. And uh, wh while it was landing, the thrusters uh, and in, uh, underneath the deck excavated uh, soil, ex excava excavated Martian regolith, and exposed ice or ice cemented ground. So ice, if you go closer to north, um, it's, it's right sitting right at the surface. So it's not, you know, out of, uh, you know, not a crazy idea to, to penetrate through this ice and uh, get down to some kind of a lake. So even go down uh, through ice and, uh, and explore it. So uh, the, we have been focusing on, on these sort of technologies that will go through a ice or ice that has a bit of uh, sediments. And the way to test it, uh, you no know, idea is to go to, uh, a, to areas where, which have um, ice shells and, uh, and some lakes underneath. So one of the example is Devon Island in Arctic. Uh, I've been to Devon and uh, Mars Society has a, uh, has a base uh, outside of Houghton Crater on Devon Island as well on the, on the Western Devon Island. So um, one way to do this is to go to these locations and uh, uh, set uh, on ice and uh, test the uh, probes that, that go uh, you know, below. So on the right-hand side, this is this is example when you start and you penetrate right through and 
and then you get down uh, to um, to lake. We have uh, for for many years we have been actually developing uh, probes like this for penetrating of Europa, but some of the or very similar designs could also be used for Mars. This particular probe is called SLUSH, and SLUSH stands for Search for Life Using Submersible Heated Drill. Um, this, this system is, uh, this probe is just over half a meter diameter, so it's not a small thing. It's not a small thing. Um, it's, it's large diameter driven primarily by uh, the reactor that it has kilopower nuclear reactor. And the probe is just over five meter tall. And if you go from a, <clears throat> from a bottom to the top on this inner picture, on the center picture, what you see is a drill bit with some kind of a percussive system. Then you have a kilopower nuclear reactor. Uh, then you have a Stirling engine for converting heat uh, coming from a nuclear reactor into electricity. Then you have a couple of high temperature uh, motors, batteries, electronics, uh, instruments. Um, idea is to obviously suction some of the, some of the water, look for, for microbes, electronics, and a communication spoolers. Uh, the way this probe penetrates is by uh, breaking ice and also melting it to form slush and pictured on the left hand side. And as it penetrates down, uh, the slush refreezes um, above the, the probe. So whatever is left in a, um, in a freeze channel is a, is a communication tether. We have, a, have done prototyping of these sort of systems. Uh, right on top, you can see the slush probe. This probe is just over six centimeter diameter and uh, uh, one point, almost 1.5 meter tall. Uh, if, you, if you were to, if you look through the cross section right towards the bottom, what you see is uh, uh, drill bits with motors and heaters because it's a heated system. Uh, some percussion systems, slip rings, uh, electric motors, right in the center, you have anti-torque assembly because if you're spinning, uh, there has to be counter-torque, right? And uh, so we have these skids to, for providing uh, counter-torque. And right on top, we have a tether bay for, um, that comes out from a, from a probe and refreezes behind uh, as slash turns back into, into ice. So uh, we've done, we have vacuum chambers uh, here in, uh, in beautiful Tadina outside of NASA Jet Propulsion Lab in Los Angeles. And uh, we have been uh, running a couple of tests to show which of the uh, mining uh, drilling system is actually most, uh, most useful. So what you see on, the, on the, in these short videos um, taken inside the Mars vacuum chamber is a probe initially melting through, uh, through ice the process is kind of slow. Uh, the, the video on the left-hand side is 300X. In the center, we use purely mechanical system. And on the right-hand side, we use combined uh, melting and, and uh, mechanical drilling. Um, so at the, in a long story short, uh, melting is very slow and it's very power intensive. Mechanical is very fast <clears throat> and very uh, energy intensive. However, the issue with mechanical system is um, sooner or later you're gonna choke up because there's no means of moving chips around the probe and uh, uh, to the top of the probe. Whereas uh, slushing eliminates the problem with, mecha with mechanical has and is significantly faster than, uh, than pure melting. Um, so that's why we called, uh, you know, we're doing slushing and that's why uh, the drill is called slush, <coughs> excuse me. So uh, um, once you, you go at the certain depth below the ground, what happens is uh, the, the borehole closes and just within the, where the drill bit is, it starts melting. So the probe on the left hand side, as you can see is a probe starts melting ice uh, to, form, <clears throat> to form slush. And uh, the, way, the reason why we know it when this happens is because sublimation stops and uh, whenever uh, drill sublimes, you can see these chips flying out um, out of the hole and they're flying out of the hole because they propelled by sublimed water vapor. Um, so water vapor is a sort of natural drilling fluid gas that blows the chips out of the, out of the way. 
once we get deep enough, uh, all this sublimation stops and you start uh, going into the melting regime. And finally, when you're very close to the, to the lake, um, again, uh, here you have a high, relatively high temperature <clears throat> and a high pressure because you're sitting in a, in a bubble uh, pictured on the, on the left-hand side. And uh, uh, again, just like in previous uh, pictures, slushing is, is the best. Um, it has relatively high energy efficiency and also a relatively high penetration rate of just over a meter an hour. So all the tests work really well uh, in the lab. <clears throat> so we decided to build uh, something uh, simple or slightly, slightly simpler, uh, purely, uh, you know, just pure melt probe <clears throat> and, uh, and go just last, last summer in uh, uh, June, July timeframe to Devon Island. So we went to Resolute and you can see a helicopter in Resolute on Economos Island. And um, we are waiting first for weather to clear and when it did, um, we flew, we took a probe and we flew on, a, on this uh, ice cap. <clears throat> Over here on the right hand side is a, uh, is a video, uh, slightly sped up, showing a probe penetrating through, through ice. And right in the center, what you can see is just a beautiful, magnificent view of the of ice cap uh, with a helicopter and uh, um, and our team uh, putting the, the probe in through the ice and, uh, and looking at penetration rates. Uh, this, this test was cut short uh, because of the weather. Uh, we had to turn around a couple of hours later and then go back, but we're planning to go again um, next year and uh, deploy slightly deeper, uh, more than, than two meters. We only had enough time to deploy two meters. And then one of you may ask, well, why helicopter? Why not um, airplane? The thing is, it gets warm, and um, you get a bit of a slash on the surface. <clears throat> so if you if you try to land with a, um, hey Chris, yeah, Chris, I apologize. Uh, we just lost Wi-Fi here for about a minute or two. Okay. So could you just go back on your presentation about ninety seconds? Repeat that. Thank you. Okay. Not a not a problem. Um, so what you see here is an um, uh, ice cap uh, on Devon Island. Um, it's it's you know close to a kilometer thick, um, and uh, <clears throat> we we use the helicopter, not the not the aeroplane or uh, such as twin otter with uh, with skis, because uh, ice gets warm, and uh, as it gets warm, obviously the friction increases, so you cannot land. <clears throat> if you land, then obviously you cannot take off because of too much friction. So that's why we, we went with a helicopter. On the right hand side, you can see a video of a probe um, penetrating through, uh, through ice and uh, a couple of meters down. We only had a few, literally a few hours to do this experiment before weather <clears throat> turned and you had to, you had to go back to the resolute. But we are going around two meters per hour at the power of 600 watts. So this is gonna continue. We're gonna go back uh, next year and uh, try to deploy a bigger probe <coughs> slightly deeper. All right, so let me uh, switch, the, uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about mining water on Mars. Uh, this is a beautiful picture of a futuristic uh, human base on the surface of Mars with starships. And um, to, for, this, for this picture to become reality, you obviously need uh, water, oxygen, and carbon. Um, and you need these, uh, uh, these elements for fuel. Uh, Starship requires a lot of water, a lot of methane. You also need energy, like for example, fuel cell at night to generate electrical power. Uh, you have a beautiful greenhouses that obviously need water and, uh, uh, and obviously a life. for life support, we, you also need water. And, and then oxygen. In fact, I would say life support doesn't require as much water and, and oxygen as fuel and, and energy and, and agriculture. That's why, that's why it's right at the bottom. Now, why, why, do we, why don't we just bring everything to Mars with us? And the issue is um, this so-called gear factor. Um, for every kilogram that we put on the surface of Mars, we have to launch 226 kilograms from the surface of Earth. So if you want one ton of uh, water on Mars, you have to 
ship 200, you have to launch 226 uh, tons uh, from, a, from a surface of Mars. So uh, things you know, add up very, very quickly and it becomes pretty apparent that you have to do some mining on the surface of Mars to make it feasible. In terms of water as a resource, on Mars actually, Mars is very rich. You have, you have quite, quite a few options. You have liquid water, as I mentioned earlier. You have ice as pure ice or ice in the ground. You have also hydrated minerals, like for example, gypsum, which has around 20% of, uh, 20 of uh, water. Regular by itself, there's uh, you know, some fraction of water and obviously atmosphere. So here, what I'm gonna focus on is uh, extracting of ice um, in uh, these sort of areas like Arcadia Planitia. Recently, there has been study uh, looked at what would be the ideal location to, uh, to set up a base. One of them is Arcadia Planitia. Uh, the reason why it was selected is because elevation is relatively low, so you have more atmosphere to slow you down. Uh, it's relatively at the low latitude, which means you have access to sun. Um, the number of rocks that are larger than a meter is, is less than 5%. So that's good. The slopes are relatively benign. Um, you have a couple of landing locations in a, within a kilometer proximity, and you have water. And uh, we found lots of water below 10 to 20 meters of regolith in these, in these sort of ice sheets. So uh, uh, we start developing a technology called the red water uh, to get down through regolith and they get down to these ice sheets. So right in the center, what you see um, is, a, is a red water. Um, it's an ISRU system uh, that combines two technologies that have been used commercially here on Earth. So they, these two technologies um, stood the, you know, uh, the test of time. Um, the, on the right-hand side, what you see is a cold tubing technology. Cold tubing uh, drilling is a, is a means of making a hole using uh, a tube. It could be a steel tube, sort of like your garden hose that is um, re-bent into a straight pipe. So you have a pretty powerful uh, injector system that turns a curved uh, tube into a straight tube. Um, and you can, you can go thousands of feet um, on the, on the, here on the earth for oil and gas and, and mining. On the left-hand side, uh, you have something called red water. Uh, this is a system used in the South Pole in Antarctica to deliver uh, fresh well, well, water to the, uh, to the base. The way it works is uh, uh, it, has, uh, it, it sprays hot water um, through the, uh, down tens of meters below the ice uh, to form cavity. And as you spray hot water, this hot water melts water around it and then the pump pumps the water, melted water to the, uh, to the surface. Some of this water is stored, some of this is, it goes through the, through the generator and heat the system, it goes back down to spray more water. So we combine these two and to form a, a you know, red water system. <clears throat> now, uh, we, we build actually a system. Uh, this is an example. Um, the reel itself for 25 meter penetration is approximately meter in a, it's half a meter diameter. So this entire injector system with a drum is close to a meter. Uh, then we have a bottom hole assembly, uh, which includes heaters and motors and uh, a, lot of, a lot of tubing. Uh, and this is a picture of a red water with tanks. So you have a, a tank for compressed CO2 and tank for water. Um, this, this entire system weighs around 66 kilograms. So it's not, that heavy. Uh, the way it drills is uh, you can see this cold tubing. We're actually flying a, a much smaller version of rare water to the moon next year. So you have this tube on the left hand side, you can see kind of spools out, goes between the pulleys and injects compressed gas. And this vacuum chamber is actually under Mars pressures. So uh, you can see the gas in vacuum, in the Martian vacuum, is extremely, extremely powerful. So uh, uh, we can drill with uh, the drill bit cuts the formation, but the gas is used to blow the cuttings out of the hole. So I'm going to play this thing again. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not just dust, but you, have, you can see 
the Veroclets being blown out of the hole at the same time. So if this, this and goes around meter per minute. So this thing goes to the moon uh, next year as a technology demonstrator, it's a heat flow probe, but the red water is essentially a bigger brother of, uh, of the system. This tubing is around quarter inch, red water is, is one inch in diameter. So to, to extract water, uh, you deploy the cold tubing, uh, you drill, and you're using compressed gas to blow the cuttings out of the hole. <clears throat> Once you get to ice, you have a pack packer system that uh, pushes against the surface. Uh, and then you start the melting process. You spin the drill bit, you turn the heat on, and you slowly make this uh, melt pool. Once you create enough melt pool, you pressurize it, and uh, water under pressure uh, flows to the surface. So there are no pumps, no pumps. Uh, this entire area is pressurized. Water under pressure flows to the tank on the surface. So uh, this shows a step one, which is pneumatic uh, drilling. This here, you, what you can see is a drill uh, going through the uh, 1.5 meter columns of ice, and you can see the snow being blown out. So this is how we how we drilling. You can see the injector over here that sits right over there. Uh, the way you you see whether the injector is working or not. On this side, the tube is smooth. On, a, on this side, the tube is uh, cut with the teeth. Uh, the, the force required uh, to, to bend it is so high that you uh, uh, plastically deform the tube. So that's why you have these, these teeth from a, from a driver gears. Here, we show that how the packer can be inflated. So we go down and you can see the packer sitting right over here. And here the packer sits inside the ice column uh, and maintains pressure of uh, you know, 40 PSI. And finally, when we got down to the, to the bottom, we actually put a die to, to, so that we can see how the, uh, what is being formed. But you could see that there is a melt pool being formed uh, in, in, a, uh, in an ice column and um, with the packer sitting right, right around. So uh, a great, you know, great uh, uh, technology so far. The, we, we did actually drill uh, a melt uh, with no rotation and rotation. So here we went down, we stopped, and we were melting by itself. And uh, in these two cases, we were rotating while melting. And uh, look down here. This is a system efficiency, how much heat went in to melt, um, to melt ice. And uh, if, if the most efficient system was obviously rotation uh, when you were rotating. And, and uh, we melt up to what, 100, almost 100 liters um, in, uh, in 15 hours with 30% efficiency. And the reason why rotation is required is sort of like when you, you know, when you put a, a, you know, sugar in a, in a tea, if you don't stir it, obviously it's not gonna dissolve. Uh, same thing here, the heat doesn't go, the water is actually really bad uh, conductor of heat, really, really bad. So you have to keep on move water what around and use, you know, convection um, to to stir it around and they heat up ice. Uh, so it works. Um, and finally, obviously, uh, after melting, we have to do um, uh, the pressurization. So here we pressurizing the borehole. Um, here we're pressurizing and we're pumping along an 11 meter tubing. So you can see water goes through this tubing and right into this container. And finally, uh, the tubing is down here in ice. Um, and uh, we, we pressurize the borehole. We are opening the tap and all it goes into the red water, goes into the, uh, into the container. Obviously, uh, this is done under atmospheric conditions. So let's see um, if it works under, uh, under Mars conditions inside the vacuum chamber. This is a simple experiment. You can do it yourself in a small vacuum with a container. It has an opening going into the, into the container, into a water container under Mars pressure. And uh, we pressurized it. And uh, by pressurization of this container, we're pumping water to this container over here. So the idea of essentially pumping water to the surface, it works. And finally, we had to do end-to-end -end tests. This is our cold room, just over five meters tall. 
uh, with uh, 1.5 meter tall of super clear eyes. You can see the uh, cold tubing sitting right over here before being uh, moved to the top. And right over here, the, in this picture, you can see the cold tubing sitting on top and the bottom pole assembly uh, drilling down over here. Uh, in this particular case, uh, we needed around one kilowatt of heater power um, and the uh, melting efficiency of was around 50%. Okay, so this end-to-end -end worked. And then um, here we did everything in our Mars chamber. This is three and a half meter or 11 foot Mars chamber with a, a red water sitting right above the drum full of ice. Um, so we drilled down, we melted, we pressurized the borehole, and then we pumped uh, to, the, um, the, to, this, to this jar, to the bottle, to the glass bottle uh, that was actually sitting, it's also inside the, inside the marsh chamber. So we uh, mined around six liters. Um, so it's a good first step, um, TRL, you know, TRL five. And right now we are building a TRL six system. Uh, this is uh, the next generation red water. It's sitting, uh, this is how it looked like uh, last week, was sitting on an assembly bench. So you can see um, a, the you know, swivel right over here, the drum sits inside this hex. And uh, here the bottom pole assembly is gonna go through the, through the injector system. Now, the, this entire architecture of drilling down it's, you don't necessarily need to use it just for, for mining ice. You can deploy, um, it could be used for uh, as a sci scientific mission, for astrobiology mission. So uh, this is an example where a lander can be dropped by a sky crane. Um, you deploy, you drill down tens of meters right at the bottom. You have bottom hole assembly with cameras, with near infrared spectrometers, with neutron spectrometers. So this is actually a neutron spectrometer. Uh, with heaters, uh, dielectric perme permeability uh, spe uh, spectrometer. So uh, this is this is our TRL five system uh, for a you know scientific mission that can go literally tens of meters below the ground with I, I would say around 100 kilograms total, including avionics and uh, uh, compressed gas and and uh, things like this required to for this thing to work. If you, if you would like more information, we published a lot of books on the subject uh, of a decade ago. Uh, this book covered pretty much everything up to 2008, 2009, and recently released uh, two books cover all the information up to approximately 2019, 2020 at the latest. So uh, with this, I'm gonna end with this beautiful picture from a, a few years ago when we went to do drilling in, in uh, outside of the summit station in, in Greenland. It was a lot of fun. So I'll stop here and uh, happy to answer uh, any other questions you may have. Thank you, Chris. We've got time for some questions. Right here. When you're pumping up this, it's not necessarily pure water. It's good as slurry. How thick of a slurry can it be pumping up? So actually, it's it's not going to be a slurry. Slurry is going to we're going to wait for a, what if you have any sediments. Uh, we're going to wait for sediments to settle down in the bottom. The intake uh, for for water is is going to be close. It's it's not going to be at the drill bit. Uh, it's going to be, you know, some distance above the, above the drill, but a couple of feet, a couple of meters. So uh, the water will have some sediments, uh, will have some particulates, but it's, it's not going to be slurry. And this is also a reason why uh, we decided to pressurize a borehole as opposed to have a pump. Uh, we didn't, it's easier to pressurize a borehole and have a thick tube for which some particulates can, can flow to the top without jamming as opposed to have a pump, right, with some uh, a diaphragm pipe or some gears and so on that could jam when you, when you try to pump fluid with, with some uh, sediments. Other questions? So, so we've been talking to Catherine Bywaters in your organization and everybody agrees that this 
to the next mission to Mars should slap an agnostic life finder on a 13 liter um, mining operation that is produced by your red water. The question is, how do you make this happen? Well, you, you obviously need to, I would say, wait, wait a few years, right? Uh, uh, until the, the Mars sample return mission is in a, uh, you know, coming towards the end and uh, the spending uh, allows you to, uh, to actually develop um, something like a red water for, for scientific applications. And then obviously you have to uh, have a, uh, you know, community input uh, from MEPAC meetings, but um, uh, so it's a matter of time. I don't think it's it's uh, if it's it's matter of when, and the uh, when depends on a on a profile, the funding profile, and uh, sooner or later, mission like like this is gonna is going to happen. Um, there is no doubt you have to go deep, right? You have to go really really deep to have any chance of finding past past life. Um, so the technology exists, and uh, uh, I think I also think that uh, emphasis should be given on a downhole uh, technology uh, development for uh, for looking at microbes downhole. The good example is something I presented a couple of years ago at the Mars Society. With the system is called Watson. Um, uh, the, we built a sort of a drilling system, and and uh, uh, Rob Barsha and Luther Beagle and others at, at that time the JPL they built. A, downhole deep UV Raman spectrometer, which was essentially repackaged Sherlock instrument from, uh, from Mars 2020. And we went to Greenland and uh, we, found, um, we found microbes. Uh, we live in a colony, um, but the issue is the, the life is not spread all around. So they, it, it's in a, it lives in a tiny colony. It's like, like we do here on earth, right? We, we live in, in cities. We're not equally spread across the entire planet. We live in cities. So life is, lives in these tiny colonies. So that's why you need a downhole instrumentation. So as you go down, you actually scan a borehole real time. If you just capture a bit of sample every so often, it's, it's a hit and miss. Uh, you may find absolutely nothing, even if you're sitting right next to the colony. Last question. Uh, this is going to be a quick question. Uh, could you make a system uh, light enough to be delivered using Rocket Lab Electron or uh, the next generation Rocket Lab rocket? Um, not electron, but next generation, yes, uh, definitely yes. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned the commercial aspects of this. Uh, we see, you know, Rocket Lab is, is launching science instruments to Venus, and uh, there is definitely, uh, a, you know, room for, a, you know, for commercial uh, companies like Rocket Labs, or even Blue Origin that, that owns Honeybee Robotics now to do a lot of this uh, scientific exploration. So yes, the future ge next generation of, of Rocket Labs rocket, yes, uh, Electron is, is essentially too small. Thank you very much, Dr. Zachney. Thank you.